Hi everybody, good morning. It has been so long since I have done, nearly put myself in the eye there, since I've done a reading vlog and that's what I would like to do today. I'm gonna to do some sample reading. As you can probably tell by the title of this video, I am gonna to attempt to find a perfect Christmas read. I didn't used to intentionally pick up Christmassy books to read at this time of year. I wouldn't say I'm necessarily a really seasonal reader, but I feel as though I have been doing that this year. Maybe that's to mark the passage of time in a more meaningful way. Last year, I read The Santa Claus Murder, which is one of the British Library crime classics. I'm not sure how many they have published, but they're kind of like Persephone books, but for crime in the vein of Agatha Christie. So if you're into that old school crime, then I would recommend checking them out. Um, I used to read Agatha Christie so much when I was a teenager. I think I read all of them. And I haven't gone back to crime until rather recently when I started reading um, more Nicky French books and a few more thrillers and stuff. But I do have a soft spot for old crime books, especially at Christmas. And the British Library do a series of Christmas crime, winter crime. On my mantelpiece, I have a set of British Library crime winter classics that I've bought recently that I haven't yet read. I'm gonna to talk to you about them today and then start reading some of them and tell you how I'm feeling. Because in the past, as I said, I read the Santa Claus murder last year at Christmas time and I loved it. But then I also read one of their other ones which is called The Christmas Egg and I really didn't like it at all. So. I feel like obviously it's quite hit or miss. Um, so I'm gonna do some sample reading and tell you which ones I'm particularly enjoying or keen to read uh, the most. And if you're looking for a Christmas crime book, then maybe this will help you out. I'm also gonna include some footage from just over a week ago um, when I did some baking and also some craft activities, which are also related to Christmas. So while I'm spending some time today reading the books in between talking to you about them, I'm gonna flash back to Jen of 10 days ago when she was making gingerbread Christmas cupcakes and also when I was making my own wrapping paper, which sounds far more fancy than it actually was, but it was so much fun. Um, yeah, so that's what this video is gonna be. I would love to know in a comment down below if you are a seasonal reader and if you like to read Christmassy books at Christmas and if you have any recommendations as well because even though my TBR is very big, I'm always open to hearing recommendations. Let me grab those books from the mantelpiece and we can talk about them. Here, very precarious, is the stack of books. I think they always have three for two on the books that they publish. They also have a title of the month that is always five pounds. Those things together are both my joy and my downfall when it comes to buying their books because it always makes sense to buy more than one. Anyway, it's Christmas. So um, I have bought a few. Some I have bought last Christmas, and as I said, I read two of them. And then I bought a few more this year. Some of them aren't Christmas related, so I'll just show you those first. They're not the ones that I'm gonna be reading from today. But you know, just in case you're interested in what's on my shelf, I have Excellent Intentions by Richard Hull, which to be fair, I think I was primarily drawn to because of the autumnal cover, but then I read the back and realized it's about a murder on a train, which is one of my favorite things. Not necessarily the train bit, but having that limited list of suspects because obviously it has to have been someone who was on that train. I also have Murder at By Matchlight by ECR Lorac, which is about a murder that happens in a park at night. I think it's during the Blitz, so it's very, very dark. And someone sees this murder happen and then sees the murderer lighting a cigarette with a match. And it's in that fleeting burst of light that they see this person's face and they're trying to remember them from that moment. I have The Division Bell Mystery by Ellen Wilkinson, which is a murder mystery written by an MP. And then this is Somebody at the Door by Raymond Postgate. And this one is set, oh, this one is in the winter actually of 1942. Oh, well maybe I will read the beginning of this one then. 
it just didn't look particularly wintry but it is set during winter okay so somebody at the door and then I have, as I said, the Santa Claus murder, which I read last year. Murder mystery set in a old manor at Christmas and one of the family members has murdered the head of the family and you're trying to work out who that was. So I'll pop that over there because I've already read it. And then this is Mystery in White, a Christmas crime story. I'm not going to read the blurbs here because I'll talk about them when I start reading them. This one, when I posted it on Instagram, had so many people saying that it was their favourites. So I'm really excited to get to this one. And then I also bought this, was, which is an anthology. It's a surprise for Christmas and other seasonal mysteries edited by Martin Edwards. I love these covers. They're really, really lovely. And then I also bought these other two anthologies, which are not part of their British Library crime classics, but they are published by the British Library. This is Chill Tidings, Dark Tales of the Christmas Season, edited by Tanya Kirk. And this one is Spirits of the Season, Christmas Hauntings, which is also edited by Tanya Kirk. Right, what I'm gonna do is I am gonna read the beginning of all of these books and I'm gonna come back to you and talk to you about whether or not I'm enjoying them. And then I'll rank them like on a list of one to one, two, three, four, five, there's five of them, <laughs> one to five, um, which ones I would like to read the most. And hopefully, as I said, if you're looking for a Christmas crime book, this will help you. And while I start reading these, I'm gonna cook, cook? I am. The word I was gonna say was cut. I'm gonna cut to cooking footage of me from about 10 days ago when I made a batch of ginger Christmas cupcakes. Christmas ginger cupcakes, whichever way round you wanna say that. They are the best gingerbread cupcakes that I have ever come across. They taste amazing and I'm not saying that to big myself up. The recipe is incredible and I will link the recipe in the description box down below. I was making a batch for Lauren for Christmas, part of her present. But then of course, if I was making a batch for Lauren, I had to make one for myself. So it was a, a, a bit of a baking bonanza and uh, I will show you that now and then I'll come back and talk to you about books. Also, this video is very kindly sponsored by Skillshare and we'll talk about that later. You know, I was going to then sit on the floor and make this look more professional, but this is where I've been reading, and this is a reading vlog. I'm sitting on my bed with this um, furry blanket. I was really annoyed at myself when I made those gingerbread cupcakes because I filmed the whole making of it the evening before, and then when I made the frosting the next day and put that on, I forgot to film it. So that is, uh, that's quite annoying. But anyway, never mind. I have read the beginning of two books. The first one that I picked up was A Surprise for Christmas, which is the anthology, not the horror one, the crime one. And the first one was by Catherine Louisa 
Perkis, which was called The Black Bag Left on a Doorstep. And I love the author information before this story started. It said Catherine Louisa Lynn was born in 1839 and married Frederick Edward Perkis, a naval officer in 1872. She published her first mystery novel, Disappeared from Home, in 1877 and regularly contributed stories to magazines. Over the next 17 years, she produced 14 books before deserting her literary career for activism. So The Black Bag Left on a Doorstep is, I think, one of the first, if not the first, stories that she um, wrote and was published about her detective, Loveday Brooke. So, yeah, it first appeared in Ludgate Monthly in February 1893. So Loveday is a female detective and they have uh, collected her stories in a book called The Experiences of Loveday Brooke, Lady Detective, which I think you can get from the British Library. Um, and this is a mystery where a bag has been left on a doorstep and a note has been left inside it. And then there is another mystery of a, a robbery at a nearby manor house. And the people in the manor house suspect their French servant because they think that she's very promiscuous and terrible. Um, so they hire this female detective to come and solve the case. It's kind of amusing because the story is really short and it's one of those, like with Sherlock or Praro, where the detective goes into the scene, looks around, spends all of two minutes there and goes, right, I'm done, and then sits down and tells you in intricate detail all of the minute things that they noticed within that two minute period, which meant that they've solved the entire thing, which is fine, I think, in a short story, but I wouldn't obviously enjoy that in a novel because you want to be able to try and solve it yourself. I did enjoy the ridiculous amounts of detail um, of the things that she had noticed. It was very... Um, out there <laughs> but I liked it then I read the beginning of somebody at the door by Raymond Postgate and this one I don't know why but it was particularly visceral I could imagine everything at the beginning of this book I think I'm not missing getting on really busy trains with people many of whom have colds and you're trying to get away from them. Like, I, I don't miss that at all. Um, but I do miss that hustle and bustle, I suppose, and the, the going out and, 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 and doing things. So the, reading the beginning of this where the main character is finishing work and is leaving to go to Euston, which is a particularly busy station. I mean, obviously this is a long time ago and it's during the Blitz, actually, so it's very different to how it is now. Um, but... Houston is a very very busy station and waiting for his train deciding whether or not he's going to get a cup of tea beforehand trying to get to his favorite carriage so that he can get on his favorite seat and then being really annoyed because he gets into a carriage with a colleague who he doesn't like and also it says with this German refugee doctor who he really hates which I guess is very topical because this was set in the winter of 1942 and he's describing everybody who's in his carriage and that he's carrying a briefcase with 120 pounds in cash in it. And I have a feeling that he is about to be murdered. He may not be, he may be robbed, I'm not sure, but I think he is about, I think he's about to die. The first chapter was quite short and it is not set at Christmas. It is set in January, so that is why it doesn't look Christmassy on the front. But I still was very intrigued by this, so it is a contender. I'm going to read the beginning of the other books now, and while I do that, I'm going to leave you with some footage from last week when I decided to make Christmas wrapping paper. I always use brown paper for wrapping, and I decided to make it a bit more exciting this year by creating stamps, Christmas stamps to stamp all over. And I decided to do that with potatoes, which is something that we did... Uh, nursery so back in back in the day and it made me feel like a toddler and I loved it so you cut a big potato in half and then you cut out the um, shape that you want to create so the shape sticks out so you're cutting away the potato around the shape that you want you'll see in the video in a second so I did um, some stars and some Christmas trees and a snowman and Mr M did some holly because he was jealous and wanted to get involved when he saw that I was doing that so it was a really cozy evening really therapeutic and I would recommend it a lot.
Okay, so it's now dark outside, but I think that this kind of spooky lighting is perfect for the theme of this video. As I mentioned at the beginning, before I get on to these three final books, this video is very kindly sponsored by Skillshare. I have worked with Skillshare for about five or six years now, nearly as long as I've been on YouTube itself. It is a fantastic online learning community where they have over 25,000 classes on so many different things. So, for instance, my video today, if you are in the mood for baking or if you're in the mood for doing some kind of crafting, they have videos on those things and so much more. So they have videos on how to do hand, le hand lettering, how to do calligraphy and how to create your own fonts. They have classes on cooking, they have classes on looking after houseplants, how to organize your time, how to do computer programming, anything you might want to do for fun and anything that you already do for fun that you're thinking of turning into work. It is amazing as a tool for recreational stuff and also for professional development. That sounded quite posh, didn't it? Professional development. Anyway, um, a class that you may want to check out if you are interested in baking is Julia Tersham's class, Easy and Versatile Baking, The One Yeast Dough You Need to Know. Skillshare have given me a link which I'm putting at the top of the description box down below and the first 1,000 of you to click on that link will be given a free trial of Skillshare Premium. If you enjoy that and you would like to stay on afterwards, it costs less than $10 a month for their premium membership. As I said, they have over 25,000 classes on so many different topics. Plus they also have sections where you can discuss your work with other people who are taking the class if you want to do that. If you just want to get on with the class yourself and not communicate with people, you can do that too. So it's as interactive as you want it to be. Plus the classes are there online for you to do whenever you have time to take them and they're broken down into really manageable chunks. It's a lot of fun. So thank you very much to Skillshare for sponsoring this. Now, let me talk about the final three books that I read. What is it about Christmas Crime and Trains? So this is another one that is set on a train. I preferred the beginning of, what was it called? It's here, this one, which was Somebody at the Door. I'm not holding that up very helpfully at all. There we go. Somebody at the door, which is the other one which was set on a train. I preferred that to this one, the opening, um, but it did make me giggle because the beginning of the first chapter starts with it snowing and it's, <laughs> it's such British behaviour. Let me find it. All right. It says, the great snow had began on the evening of December the 19th. Shoppers smiled as they hurried home, speculating on the chances of a white Christmas. Their hopes were dampened when they turned on the wireless to learn from the smooth, impersonal voice of the BBC announcer that an anti-cyclone was callously wending its way from the northwest of Ireland, and on the 20th, the warmth arrived, turning the snow to drizzle and the thin white crust to muddy brown. Not this year, sighed the disappointed sentimentalists as they slipped sadly through the slush. But then the snow comes back after everyone has complained about it leaving and it said it grew beyond the boundaries of local interest. By the 23rd, the snow was news. By the 24th, it was a nuisance. Practical folk cursed. Even the sentimentalists wondered how they were going to carry out their programmes. Traffic was dislocated. Cars and motor coaches lost themselves. Railway gangs fought snowdrifts. The thought of the thaw with its stupendous task of conversion became increasingly alarming. So I love it. Everyone wants snow for Christmas. Snow arrives, it disappears, everyone's sad. It comes back, everyone's happy, but then there's too much snow and everyone's cross about it. Such a British winter. Anyway, so there is a train that has broken down in the snow or has got stuck in the snow and we are looking at the passengers in that carriage and moving from person to person. It's quite fun because there is a man who's looking at this woman at the other end of the carriage and thinking about how beautiful she is. And then when we get to her, she's lamenting the fact that people always stare at her because she's very beautiful. So yeah, I enjoyed it. But it's not as intriguing as the other book set on a train that I had read. And then I read the beginning of chill tidings and this one 
had a paragraph in it that also really made me giggle. Here, it says, My dear reader, you doubtless are free from superstitious fancies. You poo-poo the existence of ghosts and only wish you could find a haunted house in which to spend a night, which is all very brave and praiseworthy. But wait till you are left in a dreary, desolate, old country mansion filled with the most unaccountable sounds without a servant, with none save an old caretaker and his wife, who, living at the extremest end of the building, hear nothing of the tramp, tramp, bang, bang goings on at all hours of the night. This one actually did make me shiver, and not just because I haven't put the heating on and it's slightly cold in here. <laughs> uh, this is about um, a brother and sister who inherit a house where previous residents have gone missing, especially one from 40 years ago. They never found his body. He just left. They're not relatives who they were close to, so they go to this mansion and it's Christmas time and at night, yes, there are ghosts that wander the corridors. I enjoyed that story um, and that story was called, which may be helpful, A Strange Christmas Game by Charlotte Riddell. And then I didn't read the first one in Spirits of the Season ha Christmas Hauntings because it was rather long. So I read a shorter story further in to get a, a sample of this book and it was also about a haunted house which I suppose is not necessarily surprising given that we're kind of limited on the the haunting tropes you know but it was called number 90 by B.M. Croker and it amused me because that paragraph in the chill tidings story about you longing to go to a haunted house just to prove how scared you're not is what this story is about so it's about a christmas party and at this christmas party they're talking about this house that always comes on the market nobody will take it it's called number 90 because it's haunted and there's one man who's there who says oh, i would love to go to that house and show you how ridiculous you're all being and another one says you couldn't pay me ninety thousand pounds to spend time in that house anyway so this man, Mr. Hollyoke, goes to stay in the house and perhaps something terrible happens. It didn't scare me, this one, so much. And I think because it's less immediate, Mr. Hollyoke goes to the house twice, but we don't follow him there because we're being told the story from the point of view of someone else who watches him go to the house and then the next morning, Mr. Hollyoke comes back and he tells them all about it over a cup of coffee. So I think because he's retelling what happened instead of us the reader living it in the moment that's less scary but i still i still liked it okay so let's rank these books here let's rank these five i didn't dislike any of these i think number five is probably a surprise for christmas in fact all of the anthologies are maybe my least favorite i think because i'm intrigued to continue with the novels because i've only read part of the story so maybe it is not fair but you can see how i rank the anthologies a surprise for christmas was probably my least favorite which was the lady detective story then spirits of the season which is the one about the man who goes to a haunted house and then we hear about it later then chill tidings which was about the brother and sister going to a haunted house then i think mystery in white which is the one about the snow and the train getting stuck in the snow. And I assume that somebody on this train is going to die. Um, let's see what it says on the back. On Christmas Eve, heavy snowfall brings a train to a halt near the village of Hemmersby. Several passengers take shelter in a deserted country house, ooh, where the fire has been lit and the table has been laid for tea, but no one is at home. Trapped together for Christmas, the passengers are seeking to unravel the secrets of the empty house when a murderer strikes in their midst. You know what? That intrigues me more because we're not staying on the train. And then number one, I think, is Somebody at the Door, which is the one that wasn't a Christmas one, but is set in January. And it's about a man who's got on a train at Euston to go home. And I think he's going to be murdered as soon as he gets off the train. And it's set during the Blitz. So those are my rankings. Um, and I will report back on these books once I have read them. I don't know if I'll get to all of these over the winter period, but I hope to at least get to one or two. I would like to also get to some Persephone books, which are on my mantelpiece over there as well. Do you do this with Christmas or other periods where you're taking some time off work? I'm not even taking that long off work at all. It's pretty much a few days, but I have all these ambitions of things that I'm definitely going to do, and I probably won't, 
But, you know, one can but try, one can but dream. We've got to try and find the joy wherever we can these days. Um, thank you so much again to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Please do check out the link at the top of the description box down below. I hope you're all having a good week and I will speak to you very soon. Lots of love. Bye.